Uh, hey, take your Bibles now. Revelation chapter five is where we're gonna be right now. How many guys are excited for Revelation chapter five? No matter what I asked you, you guys would like y- yell. You would yell. We're doing really, we're really doing five. For the last two weeks though, we have taken a hiatus in our study time and we've looked at the crowns that the elders will one day, that's you guys and gals, the believers, will one day use in heaven for worship. They're crowns, rewards, things that you earned while on earth and we studied all six crowns in succession. It took two weeks. The crowns where you do things right for God by his spirit, through his power, for his glory. It's all of him. It's all through him. It's all to him. It's, it's crazy. It's all about him. But he asked us to participate. It's nuts. He asked us to do it. And I've been wrestling with this and getting emails and chewing on things and ideas. And I'm saved by grace and grace alone, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Okay, Ephesians chapter two. Then the very next verse says, and God has preordained for you good works to walk in. Isn't that a cool, a cool balance? I'm saved by grace. There's nothing I can do about it. I didn't, I didn't earn it. I can't keep it. It's all him. He earned it. He's keeping it. Woo-hoo! Now what do I do? I'm going to heaven. Now what do I do? Now I get after it to the best of my ability. May the Holy Spirit convict me. May the Holy Spirit enable me. May the Holy Spirit use me. Okay, the rest for my whole life. This last weekend, even yesterday, I was in McMinnville and I was teaching at the Calvary Chapel men's retreat over there. And the first night, Friday night, I taught them out of Matthew 16. And I came across a verse I wasn't really thinking about. I'm gonna read it to you in quickness. And then we're going to get to Revelation 5. But this is what Jesus said to Peter. This is what Jesus said to Peter when Peter tried to stop Jesus from going to the cross, stop Jesus from getting too crazy, stop Jesus from being so radical, stop Jesus from his plan, okay? And he just, hey, 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 just chill, dude. That's a bad idea. You ever told God he has a bad idea? Oh, we do in very many ways. And that's when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're not mind, listen, you're not, whoa. You're not mindful of the things of God, but instead the things of man. That's, that happens a lot, doesn't it? You, you, we just, we, we process things based on what's going on now. The quickest, best thing for me right now. It's just what we do. And so Jesus exhorted him. And let me just say this. Just moments before he called him Satan, he called him Peter, he changed his name from Simon Barjona, shifting sand, son of Jonah. Jonah, one of the worst prophets, if you would, if you want to just boil it down. I'm going to change your name to the rock. Oh, cool. It's a good day for Peter. Moments later, he's called Satan. And here's the best news you'll hear all day. You who are believers, you who are the children of God, he's changed you. A new name has been given to you, a new, a new mind, a new heart. And yet there will be and has been in your past and in your future blunders mistakes whoopsies and yet you know what i would say that jesus had chosen peter and wasn't going to quit on peter he restored peter he gave peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven he used peter you and i who are chosen by god we're not going to have every day a perfect day it's just not going to happen and yet god is perfect in his commitment to us this is what jesus said to pete Then Jesus said to his disciples, right after Peter got it mixed up, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Last verse, the verse that caught my attention. Why we should be heavenly minded while on earth about heavenly business considering the crowns. Verse 27 of Matthew 16. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. Jesus here saying, Pete, don't settle for less, man. Go for the gold. Step up to the plate. Crank it out of here. Because when it's all said and done, the Son will come in the glory of his Father with all of his angels, with rewards in his hands for the works that we've done. This balance, saved by grace, not of works. But listen, please. You were saved by grace, not of works, in order that you would be saved to do works. That's the bottom line. To be a new person. 
Jesus said that you, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit and are part of his body, would be witnesses to the world. How many of you guys have ever gone street witnessing? Raise your hands. Okay, eight of you, good job. All of us are witnesses, whether you've gone street witnessing or not. And I wouldn't encourage everybody to go street witnessing. Check this out though. Your life, the way you live it, the way you process, the way people see you is to be a witness. They're gonna watch you. Why do, why do you, why do you navigate your home life that way? Why do you do it that way? Why do you, why do you get up when you fall down? What's going on? You're a, you're a witness to this world because you're full of the Holy Spirit. And what you're doing, competitor's crown, the testing crown, when you're being tested, the martyr's crown, when you're denying yourself, the crowns, you're a witness in the way you live your life. So anyways, I got fired up when I was teaching this week and I'm gonna stay fired up and teach you guys right now. Revelation chapter five, you guys excited? I already asked you that, don't scream, don't scream. It's, it's getting redundant, getting redundant. I'm gonna read Revelation five and I'm gonna pray. You guys ready for this? Oh man, I, don't, don't. Don't mind me if I start crying. Now I'm gonna start crying. Verse one. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And then I saw a strong angel. It's too early to start crying. I stop this. Ah. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. And so I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures. And in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard a voice, the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Would you guys pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that this scene is given to us to study today. Revelation 5, a futuristic scene that is about to unfold, promised, prophesied. We look forward to this day. And Lord, in Jesus' name, now as we study it, we pray that you'd sensitize our hearts to your spirit, to what you're doing, what you wanna do in our lives. Lord, because I believe the time is near that we, like Peter, can get it twisted and be about earthly things. And yet, Jesus, you declare you're coming soon with the glory of the Father and rewards in hands, and you don't want us to be caught missing out. And so we plead, Lord, come quickly. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And until then, make this group a faithful group, a group that understands, Lord, even just a little bit, the timeline of what you're doing. I pray for mercies today to listen, 
Mercies today to preach. Mercies today to act. Bless the kids, Lord. I love hearing their voices up there as they're getting into the word and the teachers. Bless them. Bless the guys and gals that have joined us maybe for the first time, the 11-year-olds and 12-year-olds. Bless them. We thank you so much, Jesus, for what you're doing. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Revelation chapter 5. And as you guys remember, studying this book of Revelation, John is on the island of Patmos, waiting to die. He's been banished to die. And God gives him the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he instructs him in chapter 1, verse 19. Write the things you've seen, Jesus Christ. Write the things which are the church there in modern-day Turkey. Write the things which will come after these things, metatauta in the Greek. And so John gives us chapter one, Jesus Christ in his resurrected form. And in chapters two and three, he gives us the instructions to the church, what the church should be doing, how we're to live our lives. And then in chapter four, he uses that Greek phrase, after these things, metatauta, I heard a voice, that of an angel, and the sound of a trumpet. <laughs> Quoting, if you would, mimicking 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Come up here! And he gets to heaven. And he sees in chapter four this scene of heaven where there's a throne with a rainbow and there's a sardis stone and there's a jasper stone and an emerald stone and it's colors and there's lightnings and thunderings and voices and 24 elders worshiping and there's these four creatures with four different faces and six wings and he's seeing all of this. And then in chapter five, there was no chapter break then. They added that for our reference. But I draw your attention now to what we just saw. And maybe somebody could fetch me a Kleenex. Sorry about that. We should develop hand signals in case my flies ever down. You guys just, you know. Give me a hand signal, <laughs> something. I, I trust you guys, I trust you guys. I got some funny stories there, but anyways, and then John. John now sees, look at verse one again. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and out. The scene develops, it climaxes. Before Armageddon is unleashed on earth, which happens in chapter six through 19, it's on the next page for my Bible. Simultaneously, John is raptured into heaven. This heavenly throne, this worship, this unveiling, this one with the scroll, the angel, who can open the scroll and nobody is found worthy except the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And John turns to see this lion of the tribe of Judah and he sees a lamb as if it had been slain. And he begins to take the scroll and worship happens and everyone's freaking out in heaven. Simultaneously on earth, we're gonna see those seals, seven seals be broken. And every seal brings a judgment upon earth, a cleansing. Because on earth, the remnants of earth are those who have rejected God, who have overlooked Christ, who have continued to justify their sin and rebellion. And now during that seven year period, we'll be in heaven in chapters four and five for seven years and on earth for seven years, there'll be tribulation. The first three and a half years will be seemingly peaceful. The Antichrist will be revealed in chapter six. He'll come in on a white horse, this false Messiah, establishing his political kingdom, maybe from America, maybe from Europe. We don't know where from this man rising to the scene, a political genius in the world that is left behind. We'll see him and he'll bring peace to them for three and a half years. And at the end of three and a half years, the tribulation will continue to unfold and its true colors will come out and all hell will break loose. During that time, chapters six through 19, the great tribulation period will be there in a couple weeks. People will be getting saved on earth. The saved on earth now will be in heaven, protected. There are people who believe that the church will be on earth during the tribulation period, okay? They've taken certain verses, they've ignored the chronological pattern of the book of Revelation as it unfolds simply. If you just read it simply in its divine outline, you won't see the church mentioned once, not even a half a mention in chapter six through 19. It's not on the earth during that wrath of God cleansing. They're protected, celebrating, because what Jesus has done 
And as John got this revelation, he wrote it down and disseminated it to the churches. And the churches for 2,000 years have been studying it. Now it's our turn. And I believe as we look to this climactic experience, this, this is it. I mean, what would you write down if you were gonna make something up? And then I got to heaven and I saw my grandma, you know, or something like that, you know. What'd you see in heaven? What, you gonna, what would you make? This isn't made up. John gets to heaven and he sees a scroll. A scroll in the right hand of the Father on the throne. What in the world? A scroll would be rolled up on both ends and come together, papyrus, and about 10 inches tall and however long. And this scroll's unique. It's written on the inside and the outside. It was uncommon in those days. But in Roman times and in Jewish times, there would be scrolls like that that were used for title deeds and details based upon property rights. Who owns what? Who owes what? How things have gone and how things are going. And they would be sealed with a string and a wax emblem and a string and a wax signet and a string, seven seals on this one. Pretty big business. And when this angel cries out, who can open it? All of heaven. And anybody? Let's look on the earth. Anybody? Under the earth? Any? Nobody. Nobody. What kind of scroll is this? Is this the secret menu at In N Out Burger? <laughs> Probably not. Much more fantastic. Nobody can open it. And yet, God, this is what he's holding. You get to heaven, what's God? He's got a scroll. All right. He's got a scroll. I believe, along with most commentators and Bible students, that this scroll that the Father holds in his hand is the original title deed to planet Earth, to the Earth that he created, to the Earth that he made. You see, God owns everything. It's all in his pleasure, and he has it all, yet God is so good, God gives away. And God made planet Earth and humanity, and he gave it to his first son, Adam. Now you take it, I made this for you. Subdue it and rule it, Genesis chapter one. Enjoy it, it's yours. He relinquished the deed to Adam. And Adam in chapter three with his wife Eve was deceived and tricked and tempted. And Adam and Eve, listen, rebelled, rebelled, rebelled against God the Father and lost and relinquished their title deeds, much like Esau would to Jacob, and they gave away what was rightfully theirs. To who? To the tempter, to Satan, to the one who now, as Jesus says, is the prince of the air who rules this world. We live on planet Earth, created by God, given to Adam, forfeited to Satan, which if indeed this is the title deed and if indeed that narrative proves true, which to me it does, that's what I believe. What else would this scroll be? It's not the secret menu at In-N-Out Burger for sure. Much more important, it's the title deed. It was lost. And in Jewish law and in Jewish history and in Jewish property rights, there were certain addendums that a kinsman redeemer, a near kinsman, a relative, could come to a family member who had forfeited their rights, who had blundered on their properties, and they could come back, and if they could fulfill the requirements, they could buy it back. If they could do what was necessary to get back that title deed, they could redeem that property for the family. And written in the title deed, on the front and back were the requirements. And simply put, the requirements for Adam and Eve that they weren't able to keep, for Satan and his fallen angels that they committed. The simple necessity is full allegiance and obedience to God the Father in everything he said to do, never veering, never digressing, never sinning, never rebelling. And when the angel asked, who has the power to open? Has anybody not rebelled in their heart, in their mind, in their will? <laughs> any any non-rebels here? This is the 9 a.m. service. This is our only hope. Okay, they, they get successionally worse. 
So, so, okay, no. So all rebels, they're all the same. Nobody. And yet Jesus Christ, this lamb who had been slain, the lion of Judah, he's all these things. The only one who hadn't rebelled, the one on planet earth facing the same temptations you face daily would say, I only do what pleases the Father. <laughs> I can't say that. Jesus could. I only do what pleases the Father. And I have done his will. And the Father subjected him, not just to a life of obedience. Hey man, don't blow it, okay? Do good. Show him how it's done. Got it, pops. Oh, and by the way, I want you also to go to the cross. What's that, Dad? Isaac would say to Abraham, behold the fire in the wood, but where's the lamb? And God will provide himself a lamb, that Old Testament picture. And it wasn't that Jesus came down in all his prowess and let me show all you peons how it's done. That wasn't his attitude. That he being in the likeness of God didn't think it robbery to be equal with God, but instead denied his deity, Philippians chapter two, and took upon himself the sufferings of mankind and not only lived in perfect submission to God in your place, because you couldn't, but then upon a perfect 33 year run, never failing. And the father led him to the garden of Gethsemane. Said, you ready for what's next, son? You ready? And he prayed, he said, Dad, I'll, I'll do whatever you want. Not my will, but thy will be done. And so strenuous was that decision that Jesus began to sweat great drops of blood. Hematridosis. <laughs> Very rare. The stress the suffering physiologically psychologically required to sweat blood Isaiah 52 says that Jesus Christ was marred more than any other person in the history of the world so much so you couldn't tell if he was beast or man just a pile of meat in the text I just read you Revelation chapter 5 it says that he sees a lamb as though it had been slain. The word slain there is butchered, sacrificed. And this one Jesus, rising from the garden of Gethsemane, wakes up his boys. Guys, wake up. My accuser is here. It's time. Time to what, Jesus? Time to fight back and get crazy? Peter would say, no, Pete, did I stutter? And Jesus would avail himself to the chains, to the whippings, to the mockings, to the beatings, to the six trials he would undergo, examining him, just like the Lamb of God would be examined there during Passover feast. Is it perfect? Is it perfect? Hey, you check it out, Ralph. Is it perfect? Can't take any non-perfect lambs. Pontius Pilate, on his second interview, this man's, this man's perfect. He's done nothing. What should we do with him? Let him go. I'll give to you Barabbas, Bar Abbas, this murderer, this false savior's named Son of the Father, Bar Abba. And they said, Give to us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And Jesus was led to the cross, this lamb slain. Why? Why? Have you seen the passion of the Christ? Why did this happen? Have you read this? Why? For this scene. So when we get to heaven, who is worthy to redeem this world? This chaotic world that is still run by the prince of the air, that is still cursed with disease and death and decay and starvation and imbalance and murder and rape and abuse and earthquakes, and typhoons, and tsunamis, and chaos upon chaos, and not one home will not be visited by disease or death. Everybody is subject to this world's chaos. And there's one, one worthy to open the seals, therefore fulfilling the requirements of redemption, of purchase, 
of fulfillment. This is the title deed of planet Earth. And if you wonder, and if you struggle with this world, then you're seeing it right. This world is cursed. Sometimes people ask me hard questions. Why did I have to bury my child? Why did, why did my marriage not work? Why did I, my company downsize? I ate organic my whole life. Why, how did I get colon cancer? I, what, what's going on? Why do bad things happen to good people? Have you seen good people? And there are no good, good people. You guys know that. Don't email me. I know, I know what it means. But have you seen bad things happen to good families? What? What? Why? Why did he die early? Why did I? Have you looked at your own life and the things you've done, the sin you've committed and been so shocked? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did they do that to me? Has your heart been damaged by abuse? Understand this. This world is governed right now, currently, by an evil landlord, Satan himself. I'll give you one justification. Matthew 4. Jesus was tempted by the devil for 40 days. And the devil tempted him to take rocks and make them into bread. He's like, hey, you're hungry? Just take care of yourself, bro. You can do it. Nah. Man shall not live by bread alone. And Jesus resisted temptation. And then the devil took him to the pinnacle of the temple and said, why don't you prove yourself God? Just throw yourself off. Angels will protect you. Just do a stunt. No. The Bible says, thou shalt not test the Lord your God. Quoting again out of Deuteronomy. Then the devil took him to a very high mountain. Matthew 4. And he showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their glories. Panoramic of the time then and forever. And Satan said something interesting. Worship me right now. And I will give to you all of these kingdoms and their glories. If it weren't in Satan's authority to propose that offer... Jesus could have stopped him and said, wait a minute, you can't give me the kingdoms and their glories. Those aren't yours to give. Jesus did not refute and argue this offer because the kingdoms of this world and their glories are in the devil's hands. Jesus resisted, leaning once again on scriptures. This truth is meant to give you an awareness of what's going on. Why, is, why there is chaos? Why there is difficulty? That we're in a battle. That we have EMTs, first responders, SWAT teams, hospitals, mortuaries and morgues. It's not supposed to be this way. Genesis 1 and 2, perfection. And yet there was a forfeiture. All of the questions in the entire world that you've ever had can be answered in chapter five. Why, why, why can we not conceive a child? Why can I not find a spouse? Why can I not find reconciliation? Why? There's a brokenness. Is there any hope? Is there any solace? Is there a plan, Lord? John on the island of Patmos waiting to die, given this grand vision of what I would say is a 2,000 year portfolio of the future, which brings us to our current time. When the Lord will return, we don't know. We know what the signs and seasons will be like. <laughs> it's gonna be just like this. Knowledge will be increasing. People will be traveling to and fro, the book of Daniel says. People will be lovers of themselves, haters of God, deceivers. It's all happening as in the days of Noah. This could be one of the greatest chapters 
to anchor into for the rest of your life. Coming right on the heels, listen, of chapters two and three. How is the church supposed to operate? I'm going to heaven. Yeah! Now what? Get after it. What's going to happen in heaven? Redemption. Let's read it quickly together. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who's worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals. This angel is not named. In the Bible, there are only three angels ever named. Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer. Archangels, two who still serve God, one who has rebelled. This angel, unnamed, Gabriel probably, but don't know. In the book of Revelation, angels are mentioned 71 times. Angels are a trip. I don't get them. Okay, I wouldn't encourage you to freak out too much about them either. They're, they're doing fine. They don't need you. We don't need to worry about them. They communicate with God. Don't communicate with them. Okay, don't try it. Not good. Verse 3. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. No one can do it. See, the angel asked an interesting question. Who is worthy to open the scroll? Worthy. Not willing Who's willing to give it a crack at it? Who's willing to buy back the world and rule it well? Who's willing to? Genghis Khan, raise his hand. I'll try it. Alexander the Great, give me a crack at it. Hitler. Many men and women have said, I'll, yeah, I'll rule the world. Caesar Nero. Hillary Clinton. Is that funny? I don't know if that's funny or not. I wrote it down. I thought it was funny. <laughs> Who's worthy? It's, it's the question of the hour. And when he looked in heaven, and when he looked on earth and under the earth, no one was worthy that could afford the, the title deed with the requirements on the inside and out. The specific title deed requirement is to rule the earth well, listen, and live in submission perfectly to the Father. To never rebel, to never fail, to never live for your own will. And when John looked around, oh, come on, come on, who's gonna open it? There's gotta be somebody, somebody, and there was nobody. Nobody could fix it. Verse four, so I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. Guys, this is John, Jesus' best friend. He had seen Jesus around 60 years earlier ascend into heaven. He lived with Jesus. This is John. In John's 95, the Bible says he weeps. In the Greek, it literally means he loses it next level. We're talking Kleenex commercial, you know. So, have you been this devastated before? Have you looked at the plight of humanity and the pain and just been broken? On Thursday, we gathered here as a staff. We're trying to gather on Thursdays. We gather on Tuesdays and we gathered on Thursdays and, and we just said, look, we're gonna, we're gonna be from 10 to two. We're gonna call it office hours where we're just here. You guys can come hang out with us if you want. Just hanging out at the church doing stuff. And, and so we, we, let's, pray, let's start with prayer. And uh, it was all set up for the men's breakfast and tables everywhere. We just sat down. And guys, I can't even explain it. We just started praying for each other and each other's families and people we knew of and we just sensed the, the pain of our community. And we wept. 
And we just, we just cried out to God, Lord, heal us. Heal our, our friends and our, the people that are suffering. And here John, he looks at the heaven and earth and, wait, no one can fix it? There's nobody? And he loses it. It's perpetually going to be this way? There's no rescue? And in verse 5, one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. In this heavenly scene, you have the Father. You have the four creatures. You have angels. You have the herald angel who is worthy to open the scroll. This gladiator angel. And you know who tells John, hey, we got a hero. It's one of the elders, one of the humans. Why, the hum why did an elder tell John this? I suggest because that elder, like no other created being, understood the joy of Jesus because that elder's you and me. As we are rescued by the rescuer and that elder, that one who had been a rebel himself, a rebel herself, been rescued and knew John don't weep we've got one there's one there's one worthy after 7,000 years of historical chaos on earth calamity and disaster birth defects and deformities and divorces confusions and perversions just upheavals and coups and wars there's one. It's the lion of the tribe of Judah. I might need another Kleenex. I've got some mints in my pocket if anybody wants those later too. <laughs> so gross. It's disgusting. These titles that this elder gives to this one, the lion of the tribe of Judah, all the way back to Jacob's prophecies in Genesis 49, echoed in the book of Isaiah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus would hail from the tribe of Judah. Lion, you can't get more prestigious than a lion. The king of the jungle, the top of the food chain. There is no predator that preys upon the lion. the root of David. This would be impossible, by the way, because Jesus came from David's lineage. He would more likely and rather be and simultaneously be called the branch of David. It comes from, comes from David. But here he's called the root of David. He's before David. And you, you, who know, you, you get this, you know this. It's spectacular. This is the main message that Paul brought to the first world churches. Guys, this Jesus he is before King David. All the Psalms are written about Jesus, not King David. This one has prevailed. Verse six, and I looked and I behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. This imagery that John gives to us, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, Oh, let's look at this lion. It's not a lion, but it's a lamb as though it had been slain. I propose to you that it's actually not a lamb. Don't let your mind get into this idea of a real lamb. But instead, he is both lion, Jesus Christ, and he is sacrificial lamb. The Greek here and throughout the rest of Revelation, when speaking of lamb, speaks of a pet lamb, a baby lamb, which would be the same lambs that they took into their homes in Egypt there on the night of the 10th plague when they would sacrifice that lamb 
and take its blood in a bowl with hyssop branches and put it on the tops of their door posts and the sides and the threshold. A perfect cross. Thousands of years before the Lamb of God. Lambs would be slain throughout all of Egypt that night. Baby lambs. Innocent lambs. Perfect lambs. If that makes you sad, it should. John now sees, look, where's the lion? And he sees Jesus. As though he'd been slain. I believe not with scars, but with wounds. Maybe not fresh, but the imprints of humanity. The only man-made thing in heaven. It's gonna be the scars and the wounds upon our Savior's body. It's what we gave to him. And he sees this lamb as though it had been slain. Now, guys, I believe this is a picture of a 2,000-year futuristic event from then. It's our current days. It's going to happen soon. There's no other choice except worldwide Armageddon, which actually kind of ties in. It's going to happen. And when he sees it 2,000 years into the future, what is heaven celebrating? The cross. As I was getting ready to go to the Calvary Chapel McMinnville Men's Conference, I was the keynote speaker. And I was in over my head and intimidated and scared, like I am every Sunday. And I, I was talking to my good friend Adam Pearson up in Portland. I said, you know what's radical? He teaches up at skate churches up there and other places. I said, you know what's radical about what we get to do? Is we grab a book and we tell stories out of it. <laughs> They're not even our stories. <laughs> How cool is that? We get, we get to talk about Jesus and Peter and James and John and Joseph and Daniel. We, get to tell, we, get to, we just get to tell stories. <laughs> how, cool, how hard is that? We get to point to Jesus. What happened then? Because what happened then transcends time and transforms lives. See, the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. There, you can't add to it. Don't subtract from it. Don't deviate to other things. It's, this is what John, John gets to heaven. Whoa, crazy, what's going on? Whoa. That's like a lamb had been slain. This is a futuristic event. It describes this lion, this lamb, this root. Again, visually, I don't think it was any of those things. And then it also says he has seven eyes, seven horns, and the seven spirits of God. Now, if it is a lion and a root and a lamb, seven eyes, seven horns, and seven spirits, it's a pretty crazy looking creature, right? Those are all pictures of who Jesus is in his fullness. Horns in the scriptures speak of strength and power. Seven is the number of fullness. This lamb that had been slain, full power, full strength, full reign, okay? No comparison. Eyes speak of insight, wisdom, knowledge, omniscience. This lamb, everything is his. He sees all, knows all, controls all. The seven spirits of God, like in Isaiah chapter 11, speak of the full character of God, is within this lamb had been slain, this root of David, this lion of the tribe of Judah. It is all found in our gladiator hero, Jesus Christ, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, Verse seven, and he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. This, this has not yet happened, guys. Currently, the creator of the heaven and earth, God himself, holds the scroll. And he's waiting for this moment. When the church is there, and when we will all see, hey, we've been raptured, we've been rescued. Who, who's worthy now to redeem the earth? in its chaos, in its battle. And one day we'll see what happens next. We'll be here. Jesus walks to the Father and he takes the scroll, verse eight. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. <laughs> the prayers of the saints, quickly. Did you know that when you pray, God hears every prayer you've ever prayed? And he answers it in three ways. Yes, no, and later. One of those, okay? God didn't answer my prayers. Yeah, he did. He just said no. 
or he said later. Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I believe that primary prayer has been packing this bowl full for 2,000 years. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In Jesus' name. And you look around you're like, nope, not today. It's in his inbox, his active box. And when he grabs the scroll, these elders like, hey, pour it out, here it comes. Let me just encourage you, don't quit praying, keep praying. It didn't work. Yes, it did. By faith, you must believe he heard you. As a matter of fact, if you've ever had a good day at all in your life, okay, you ever had one of those? It's pretty awesome. It's awesome. I propose to you that those good days and blessings that you've experienced in your life are the answers to prayers that have been prayed days, weeks, and years before. See, we're weird. We pray, and we want it to be like a mobile order at Starbucks. <laughs> Yesterday, I was in McMinnville, and I needed some coffee, and I ordered a quad shot Americano, and on my app, it said, this drink will be ready in around 15 minutes. And I thought, what, what hell am I living in, you know? <laughs> 15 minutes? They were busy, they were busy. It was just, it was a, it was a Nick Mid I don't know where I was. And we treat prayer that way. I prayed. Here, the bowls are full. Verse nine, and they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and you've redeemed us to God by your blood and out of every tribe and tongue, people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Guys, Bible students, chapter five, verse nine, is only sung by the elders, the church. If you're looking for more proof that the church is in heaven, not on earth, in the next six through 19 chapters, You've redeemed us from every tribe and nation. This isn't just Israel. This is everybody who has come to faith. The church is in heaven, worshiping God. Verse 11, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's not a literal number. It's a myriad. Unnumerable. John, what? I mean, he was just crying a few seconds earlier, and now he sees this worship service, the prayers coming out, everyone freaking out, worshiping. By the way, who told these people to worship? Nobody. It wasn't a worship pastor saying, guys, we're going to worship now. It wasn't a, a, a pastor, a t or was it? You know, what made, you know what made these people worship? Revelation. They saw Jesus. I got no other thing to do but worship. I don't feel like worshiping sometimes, okay? It's not about your feelings. It's about revelation of Jesus Christ. Who's Jesus to you? Is he the lamb? <laughs> Bow the knee. Easy peasy. It's not even hard. I pray that we get to that place where it's not even hard to worship ever. It's not hard. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I know the Lord. I worship him. They say with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Every creature, verse 13, which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And then the 24 living creatures, or 24, then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and never. I'm going to have Ryan come up. He's going to lead us in a song. We're going to take communion. Guys, chapter five. <laughs> a heavenly scene like no other. Where it all makes sense. Oh, that's what we've been leading up to. That's what we're waiting for. That's what we need. That's why life is tough. And God is good. Don't confuse the two. And as you come to the table this morning, the table of communion, and imagine the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the lamb that had been slain. In simplicity of heart, worship him. That's it. You're rebels, you've sinned. You've erred. There's no argument. What do I do now? What do I do now? Worship. Worship the one who's worthy, 
the one who hasn't rebelled, rebelled, the one who hasn't sinned, the one who is worthy, the one who has made you priests and kings by his own blood. What? This is what we're going to be doing in heaven forever and ever. This is it. We're going to be worshiping. Everything is answered. Everything is answered at the table of communion where we see our savior, our hero, our champion. And so would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, in Jesus' name, as we come to the table now, we're here. We're, we're in the war. We're on earth. <laughs> we're here. We're no different than John on the island of Patmos, no different than the church of Smyrna and Thyatira, no different, Lord. And you've given to us, though, your word, which is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path, which, Lord, gives us instruction and purpose, that, Lord, shows us what you're doing, what you've done, and what you intend to do. And so in Jesus' name now, Lord, as we come to the table of communion, as we celebrate who you are and what you've done and what you're doing, I pray in Jesus' name, you would mature this group, Lord. This group, Lord, as we worship you today in this moment, and not just here, Lord, but would worship you, Lord, in everything, in every season that comes our way. Lord, you died on that cross. Your blood was shed. Your body was broken for our sins. And Father, we pray now that you'd be honored as we consider ourselves rescued as we consider ourselves loved, as we consider ourselves those ones, Lord, who you fought for. May you now, Lord, be honored in what we do as we examine ourselves, Lord, and proclaim your death until you return. May you, Lord, be lifted up. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.